okay it looks like everyone's here um so welcome everyone um to this week's edition of paleo Perks. and we're really excited to have melina jobbins from the university of zurich in switzerland um to present a talk um about uh, placoderms from the anti-atlas of morocco um, model for high disparity in early vertebrates um, so we'd also like to thank the Linnaean Society of London for financially supporting this talk. Um, and now we'll introduce the format of today's seminar. Um, if you haven't been to a Paleoperk seminar before, or this is one of, or you haven't been for a little while. So uh, we have a welcome and announcements for just under five minutes, which we're doing now, followed by Melina's talk, a moderated Q&A, um, and Melina has very kindly agreed to stay for tea time as well, which we very much encourage you to stay for. Um, and remember to uh, send your questions via the chat directly to me. Um, so I am questions at Paleopex um, today. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping. Um, Paleopex values the participation of everyone interested in the paleo sciences. Um, please remember to abide by our code of conduct during today's seminar. If you somehow found yourself here without having signed this, please take a moment to go to our website um, and have a look um, at the code of conduct. Please remember to meet yourself for the duration of the talk. Um, you shouldn't be able to unmute yourself, but if you find that you can, um, please remember not to so that we can keep a nice, quiet environment for our speaker. Um, you can ask questions by chatting directly to the questions that PaleoPerks host, or you can use the raise hand function and we'll allow you to um, unmute yourself and you'll be able to ask a question by voice. Any technical issues should also go to the questions host. We have closed captions built into our Zoom and you can use the CC button to show or hide them. Um, also remember to nominate all of your amazing early career friends and colleagues um, to um, do a PaleoPerk seminar. Um, and remember to fill in our weekly feedback form for demographic information. So this is anonymous, optional, but very much encouraged. And you'll be able to find both of those links in the chat window um, just now. Um, so now I'm really um, excited um, to welcome this week's speaker, um, Melina Jobbins. So Melina did her bachelor's at um, the University um, of Poitiers in France followed by a master's at the University of Bristol in the UK. Um, and she's just completed her PhD at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. Um, and now I'll hand over to Melina. Okay, hope everyone can see the screen. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, so I'm just gonna, I mean, I got the introduction, so I might as well dive in. So I'm going to talk about placoderms of uh, Morocco. And uh, I just put a quick summary here. So we start with uh, introducing very briefly the Morocco, where I'm going, the Anti-Atlas region and uh, the Devonian time. So where how it was, how Morocco was, or more specifically, where during the Devonian period. Uh, then I'm, we're going to dive into when we're going to be looking at placoderms. And uh, I'm going to introduce then these uh, three or basically my PhD work, most of my PhD work, which is uh, these three uh, very cool placoderms. And then I'll do a bit of a conclusion with some recap, mix in a bit of paleoecology interpretations, feeding, stuff like that. So to get things started, uh, was this, we have here a map of the, um, the world back during the late Devonian, like Devonian, late Devonian specifically, which is about 370 million years for this map. And uh, you can see the continents look quite different than what it looks like now, right? And uh, if you look at the red star here, this is where Morocco was located at the time. Now, if you zoom in, I put a little Google Maps just to show you Morocco and the region itself that we focus in the red square, which is the Anti-Atlas. And back in the days during the late Devonian, the Anti-Atlas was divided into two, well, three basins, two main ones, the Maida and the Tafilalt and the uh, corresponding platforms as well, the Tafilat being the main uh, larger platform. And this, the whole region is one of the most fossiliferous areas in Morocco, especially when it comes to the Devonian period. This is very rich and gives us a lot of cool fossils information. We're still learning now uh, a lot about it and discovering new things as we go. As, and this is to show you a little bit, uh, one little picture of uh, the play, one of the areas I go when I go there in the field with uh, my colleagues. And uh, lots of fossils that actually worked on in my PhD come from this. Like I'm trying to show you with the mouse here in the lower part of the image. And it is what we call the thylacocephalon layer. 
specifically, named after these crustaceans, which were my first chapter in the thesis. So these animals, lots of these animals in these layers uh, come in these uh, little red nodules. The thinacocephalans that come in these nodules, you can see this are not the biggest ones, right? But you can see in some bigger ones, you can find sharks, shark remains, but also placoderm remains. Uh, so speaking of placoderms, well, what are placoderms? Uh, for those who don't know, so placoderms are early fish, and fish are the largest and most basal vertebrate group. Um, being one early fish group, that means that they are key to understanding the origin, but also evolution of multiple vertebrate features, as well as the body plan. And this includes jaws, teeth, uh, bone, in addition. So you can see here a bit of where they're located in the phylogeny, in the basic phylogeny of the vertebrate group. So placoderms are located here, towards the base of the fish group, with the jawless fish being uh, phylogenetically earliest. Uh, the high abundant, they're highly abundant during the Devonian period, as you can see here for all the different uh, fish groups. And this is why we gave uh, the nickname for the Devonian period, the age of fishes, because they have so many in diversity, disparity, just on all aspects. So, patterns. They lived from the Silurian to the end of the Devonian when they all got extinct. And there, as I mentioned, among the earliest jawed vertebrates, uh, there's over 300 genera that have been described so far. Uh, they're part of what we call the stem gnathostomes, so the stem group of gnathostomes being the jawed vertebrates. Uh, they have a skull and thoracic part that are made of bone, so bony, uh, like a bony armor is what we call it. Uh, but then the rest of the skeleton, all that's post thoracic, is basically made of cartilage that is lined with perichondral bone. And these remains are usually very rare, very hard to find because the preservation is just not good enough, a bit like in sharks, for example. So there's a lot of, as you can see in the pictures here, in the picture on the side, there's a lot of uh, morphological variety between different groups already, as you can see, for example, with the most famous one, the Clostus, uh, where you can see with the fossil, what we know from the animal versus what was reconstructed. So we imagine it looking a lot like uh, an apex predator shark-like, uh, body shape. And uh, we have other animals from the other groups like Botryolepis, for example, Antioch or uh, Gemundina, both of them having a more flattened body and interpreted as living closer to the sea floor. So now I'm going to focus more on arthrodites for my tool because that's what I would what I was working on in uh, Morocco, more specifically. So uh, what are the defining features of arthrodias? Well, there's two to keep in mind. The nuchal gap, which is that slot you can see on the top, on the dorsally between the head and the thoracic arm, uh, which allows movement basically for the for the head and the jaws to open. And then uh, there are this uh, lower jaw, of course, and the upper jaw. The upper jaw specifically is divided in two elements in arthrodias, the anterior and the posterior suprarenal. So you have the anterior here and then the posterior here. And you can see it's also the arthrodias is also the most, as to remember, the most common, but also the most diverse group of placoderms. So they give a good reflection of what we know from placoderms at the time. And just to show you a bit the morphology of placoderms, specifically arthrodias. So you have the head and thoracic armor, you have the, the pectoral and the pelvic girdles already, uh, and fins, of course. Uh, the dorsal fin, caudal fin, of course, and then the just the elements to remember uh, for this talk are these two. The uh, inferognathal is what we call the lower jaw in placoderms, and in the and the upper jaws are called the suprognathals, as I mentioned before. Now I'm gonna jump into the first uh, placoderm that I've worked on, which is called Amasictis and Trinasticae, named after Cape Nastic in Australia. So. You can recognize the map, I suppose, Morocco, the same region that I talked about. And this animal actually comes from that layer I showed you, the Thiacocephalon layer, and it outcrops in multiple areas in the Maida Basin, in this red area on the map. And you can see the little stars for some of the localities where the animal came from. This dates back to the late Fermanian, so the last, uh, middle Fermanian, sorry. This is the last stage of the late Devonian. And so what's very interesting about this guy is well, when you look at 
this specimen, the holotype, the, at first, when you don't really know what you're looking at, you think, well, yeah, well, blob. Uh, but actually, when you get a closer look at the specimen, get to you know take the time, look at it, you see all of these very interesting features. You can see the counter the imprint, sorry, of the skull roof and the thoracic armor. But you can also see uh, traces of the pelvic fin, even though the fin is not preserved itself. But you see traces of, you can see the outline of the pectoral fins, the dorsal fin and the caudal fin, so pretty much the body outline. Uh, you also see remains of, uh, of the vertebral column, as well as a weird structure here, uh, called, which we interpreted as a, lateral, a structure homologous to a lateral keel, which you can see in some modern fish and sharks as you can see, for example, in that picture for the poor eagle shark. You can see a bit more of the outline of these fins here for the animal. And this is something that's very rare in, uh, well, the fossil record, I want to say in general, because it's all soft tissue, right? Then we have another, this was the other very nice specimen that we got from the field, uh, which again, doesn't look like much, but actually has a lot of information. The thoracic armor again, more of a bit more remains, and again, some of the body outline, we have a bit of the dorsal fin as well as uh, the caudal fin. In this case, you can see the caudal fin is different. The ventral flap looks a lot um, longer, right? But that's because the dorsal uh, the dorsal part seems to have uh, flipped over and ended on the ventral part. And we have remains in this one of the scapulocoracoid, so the pectoral girdle as well, even though we don't have the fin. So that's pretty nice. We placed it, of course, in a phylogeny, uh, and we came to the conclusion, thanks to this, that uh, we have a selenostade. It's the, the, the family selenostade. And the selenostades are animals that are have in common. They all have large eyes, and, of course, the associated characters, including a short cheek region. They have very slender jaws with small, very small teeth, like we can see in Amasictis as well. Uh, they all date back to the late Devonian. Many, most of them from the Franian, so the stage before, but a few of them from the Fermanian, including this guy, and some of them at least lived in shallow uh, seas. So with this body outline, keeping in mind that this is something that's really rare, we have to we we will we compare this with what we know from other Arthrodia body outlines that we know, and we have these two Arthrodias. Uh, to compare with. So we have African Aspis in the middle and at the bottom Cocos Deus, which some of you guys might know because it's one of the most known placonyms as well. And you can tell by sizes, they're already quite smaller, right? Much smaller than Amazictis. But also they have these very, dis like they have lots, some key differences lying in the placement of the dorsal fin, as you can see. Dorsal fin in the other two creatures are much more posterior. And this is what you see in most, in, usually in all placoderms. The dorsal fin is not right after the thoracic armor like it is in Amethystis. It's actually quite noticeable. You even have in the, to get into detail for a second, uh, the in the thoracic armor part, you actually have a slit going inward instead of going outward for most, like in most, like in Cocos too. So you can see here for the median plate, so the very dorsal plate here. And this is, seems to be for the insertion of uh, muscles to hold that, to associate it with the fin, which is pretty cool. We also have this lateral keel, which we haven't seen in any placoderms before. And we have a caudal fin that looks very different than the ones known so far, even though it's something that we could expect, like in Dumplastus, for example, we didn't have any fossil evidence for it until now. So we put this in a, in a PCA, and you would say, well, we don't have any body outlines, so what did we plot that against? So we decided to plot this against uh, with the most, the closest related uh, group, that still has extant um, descendants, so we can actually have a bit more of a comparison with something we actually know of. And in this case, we picked sharks because they're the closest group with living relatives. And so what we did was in on one hand, thanks to Umberto, uh, we got the body outline on one hand, and we also did only the caudal fin on the other, like two separate analyses, so that we could, because why only the caudal fin? Because the caudal fin is considered to have the most information regarding the mode of life of the animal. So we did it for both, just to compare, see if we get something different. And it's pretty much the same thing everywhere. So 
they plant with this specific group called the macropelagic swimmers, so basically the active swimmers, like you imagine sharks nowadays, the predatory one, you know. Uh, so, and this, in addition to the features that we've seen so far, this works, right? This concurs with what we've seen. And having the presence of this lateral keel also suggests that it could have reached high swimming speeds if it wanted. Now, when we think of Arthur Dyer disparity, disparity being morphological diversity, very much, we think what I've shown you before, right, just now, like body, body morphology. But also, because in placoderms this is so rare, like in lots of fossils, in this case, we think of the skull or the thoracic armor, because this is what we know from most of these animals. So they are put two extreme examples of like different looking creatures with skulls. So these little bodies with these very long rostrums, which reminds you a bit of like swordfish, for example, right in morphology. Uh, but also we think a lot about teeth or jaws specifically because all this, not because they are among the earliest fish, some of the first jawed fish and, and jawed vertebrates, these give you a lot of information about what, about jaw mechanisms and how the diet and feeding that was already present at the time, right? So you can already see that there were quite a bit existing at the time, lots of variation uh, adapted for some of them for same diets, right? For example, these two uh, fellas on the left, Aritzumbia and uh, Abuchnostade, which had these uh, both interpreted as durophagous diets, these crushing like teeth, mostly with tooth rows and quite sturdy teeth. You have uh, Titanictis here at the bottom right, which is interpreted as a filter feeder, thanks to some FEA. Uh, Dunclostis, of course, as we all know, with his shearing uh, jaws. Uh, Prodostis, which is an interesting one, which uh, has mostly a shearing edge, especially as an adult, but as a juvenile still has these teeth. So suggesting a different diet than when it was younger. And continuing on that, we have little fellow which is it's a small chapter because it was only this one bone but it was a very interesting bone because it had a lot of different things that we haven't seen particularly in in these groups before so much right so you can see we call it nipton because of the odd tooth rows and odd teeth that mostly because of especially because of the orientation of them so you can see this is the first this is the posterior suprugnathal so the sec so the posterior part of the upper jaw so the second element, you can see it there with Cocos too, as an illustration to kind of give you an idea where it's located. And the this is the anterior and the teeth point to the posterior. So they have this vertical tooth, like tooth, tooth rows thing, sorry, with horizontal teeth, like near horizontal teeth, which is something you don't expect, right? Because with the movement, these teeth don't seem to be particularly useful for all for the what we use them for, right? Chewing and stuff like that, shearing or whatever. So then you have to think about what could what could these teeth have been used for? They also have these depressions in the back when we see T scanned it. When you look at the image on the right with the arrows, which was most likely when the um, indentations made by the lower jaw when in contact when it made contact. So there is, the occlusion is higher, so the teeth do not help with mastication in any way, right? Or don't seem to be, at least. So then we think about things like, for example, could it be used as in some fish, few fish groups to maybe trap life prey, for example, like we see also in reptiles like snakes. This could be an option. Uh, this one is from the middle Fominian, uh, mid, sorry, middle Givetian, middle Devonian. Uh, comes from, again, anti atlas. Uh, pretty similar, again, in Amida, it comes from uh, Jebel Zirek. Uh, from, more specifically, these mines called the Jotops mines, which are, some of you might know, is like these very large, massive trilobites from Morocco. And so, of course, as I told you, we CT scanned it, so we had a look at what we could actually get, what kind of information we could get from it. And we could actually see, looking at the teeth closely, that we were able to segment out not only the dentinous tissue in blue, but also the pulp cavity for many of these teeth and tiny little uh, vascular canals as well for some of them, which is pretty interesting and it's very, it's not something you see very often in them. Uh, and 
thinking of trying to think because we only have this one bone we tried to think about okay at what's could we determine at what stage of life was it in like was it an adult subadult juvenile and there was some research back in the 80s suggesting that the suggesting but also correct sorry that um that especially these upper jaw morphologies tend to change over time as the animal gets older so you would start with like at the uh, if you look at the picture on the right the upper the upper one so this would be a juvenile in plodosteus and you would start with a bunch of teeth all around the ventral surface but as the animal gets older and even though teeth gets added the lower ones the ventral ones gets worn down because there's no enamel in these animals so they they just get the teeth just get worn down sounds painful probably wasn't uh, and then you end up with something very different looking right as an adult so based on this we suggest that the animal that we have was uh already an adult at the time and then we couldn't make a phylogeny with it of course so we tried to think more about things like comparing it morphologically to start with with other jaws other other jaws that we know of and these are a bunch of different ones. So you can see Leptodontic still on the upper left. And then some of the different arthroditis here in the image with. You can see they look very different, right? The most similar one would be uh, Plodosteus in, in, these, in a way of like the tooth rows, for example, and these flat ventral surfaces. So we do see a slight correlation when uh, during the observation with like noting features. There is a slight tendency to having a bit of a difference between the two main arthrodia groups, cocosteomorphs and pachyosteomorphs, cocosteomorphs including cocosteus, for example, and pachyosteomorphs including this big donkloosteus. And some of these jaws look a bit different from between them, like there are a few small differences. And so we thought, oh, we suggested that this animal belonged to then potentially uh, the prodostate family. Uh, just at least what these has affinities possibly with it uh, due to the similar morphologies associated with these plodostates. And plodostates, plodostates, sorry, tend to plot sometimes in cocosteomorph, sometimes in pachyosteomorph. This is the, it's like the one family that has some features from both. So they're a bit tricky to place phylogenetically, even though the family stays consistent within the placement outside on a larger scale is a bit undecided. So here it's placed within Cocosteomos, which is the one we tend to see a bit more. But there is no consensus yet over the placement of the family. And now to get to the more interesting one, the one I'm finish, well, I finished now, but is under review at the moment, uh, is this little fella here called Elinacanthus. Uh, Taking how beautiful it is with that long lower jaw. Uh, so this animal comes from two different places. Uh, it comes from not only Morocco, but it also comes from uh, Poland, the Holy Cross Mountains in Poland, and dates back to the Fermignon as well, just a tad later in age than the Thylacocephalon layer. And you can see again the map, you can see where some of the specimens come from in Morocco, and as I said, in Poland in the Holy Cross Mountains. You can see a little map of Poland on the very top, so you can kind of see where that's located. And it has an interesting history, uh, the specimen, it's specimens, like the story itself of the animal. So Aninacanthus was first described in 1957, just with this very brief description here. That's all that came from Aninacanthus, this plus uh, two specimens. So the one in A and C and D being the same ones in different view. And the basic, and the, the, the author assigned it to being a interpreted as a very odd looking fin spine, which is why I gave it the name Aninacanthus for an alien looking, weird looking spine of a fish, possibly placoderm. So he wasn't far off with, he was, wasn't too far off in the sense that he had placoderm, right? But that was not a fin spine. And from then on, there was nothing in the, in the publication record. So jumping into the early 2000s, Elva Deliev and Elin Grogan at the Na uh, Paris Natural History Museum came across some Moroccan specimens. The ones from before them from, from Poland, sorry. And these ones are from Morocco. And you have, so the, this is once the top ones, except for the slower jaw at the bottom, 
the rest comes from the same specimen, uh, but that was broken off during preparation, unfortunately. Some of the elements fell off, but you can see like the, the orbit would be here on each side. And you have so some of the some of the lower jaw, you have elements of the upper jaw, uh, the nose, the rostrum, and a few more uh, plates in the back. So you have mostly the interior part of the skull that was there. And using this plus the associated specimens, including this infragnathal lower jaw at the bottom of your picture, they were able to determine that this was actually not what they what was interpreted as a fin spine is actually not a fin spine, but the lower jaw. Still very alien looking though, so the name still is pretty fitting. And from then on, unfortunately, for different reasons, the project was put aside and just didn't wasn't like wasn't worked on anymore. In the meantime, Bot Schreck, another co-author of mine, uh, working in Poland, found additional specimens in the Holy Cross during his field trips. And during one of his paper his paper in 2020, so uh, wrote that the fin spine was actually a jaw most likely of an arthrodire. So I gave a bit more detail. And now we're adding a lot more to it with this paper that we're doing. And also this new specimen that we have in uh, in Zurich, also from Morocco, where you see a nearly complete skull that's been a bit pushed in on one side, you know, a bit shoved in on one hand on one side, but the other side's really nice. Both sides are very nicely preserved. Very nice preparation work. And you can see some Two or three main things to remember is first the large orbits. You can see with the line drawing if this helps. They have very large orbits. And then of course this very long lower jaw. Here this lower jaw is not even complete. But we like based on the other specimens, we estimate that the lower jaw was about twice the length of the skull itself. And you can see the upper jaw sh the they shifted a little bit to the front, but the upper jaw, when you put them back in place, it's actually pretty much at the same level as the rostrum. So you can see in the picture here, actually. And this is what the, the line drawing reconstruction looks like. So it's a very weird looking animal, right? And uh, because of how weird these jaws are, the whole functioning, the whole you know biomechanics of it is very different. Because of course, if you've seen in, if you've seen in placoderms, like we imagine Dr. Osteus, as I've shown you pictures of it before, the face is very rounded, right? Like all placoderms are like this, that this very rounded face, like you'd expect. And so the jaws have this very U shape if you look ventrally or dorsally. So you'd always have this curving of the, with the anterior and the posterior supraglutinacles together. But in this case, it's not possible, right? And this is what we have with the fossil evidence as well. The, the upper jaws are very straight in one direction. Even the dorsal processes for holding against the palate are also very, very straight. So they have this very weird orientation to allow movement for the jaws to fit in basically uh, when it goes up and here we go and we also if, in addition to this we noticed a feature that's in both the paris skull and the zurich skull this triangular looking element that's located just going inside the jaws a little bit at the bottom under the infraknathals, both located in the same place. That was a bit of a head scratcher. We worked on that with some of the colleagues trying to figure out what that could be. And our best interpretation was that this would be a part of the branchial arches or the hyoid. Uh, for those who don't know, this is what you expect in sharks, for example, this is where you look. So the, that's basically what holds the, gill, the gills um, in in these animals. And the when you say the branchial arch, you would think of the very first element uh, would basically is what transforms into the palatoquadrate and mycos cartilage, so the, the jaw elements. So looking at this, you have this triangular piece and this little associated piece in the front. So we associated this as being part of the, as, as I said, the branchial and hyoid um, elements, the triangular piece being what we call the serratohyal or a part of the serratohyal with the G, the figure in G being the part that was attached to the back actually, but fell off during preparation as well. And if you want to see the serratohyal, here we go. And that tiny little thing in the front could be the basihyal, which is the little additional element you can see in uh, the Zurich skull. So thinking now about, again, jaws, going back onto the jaws, because there's so much in these jaws. Not only do the teeth go past the occlusal margin, so they go past 
the low, on the lower jaw, the teeth go past the limit with the uh, occlusion with the upper jaw, suggesting possibly high, uh, in a very uh, sudden, sorry, increase in growth for the lower jaw. In addition to this, there's also the orientation of the teeth. Again, not as drastic as you've seen in Leptodontictis, the one before, uh, but also there is still some posterior orientation of the teeth in, these an in this animal. And we saw this in all of the specimens. So it's not just, you know, deformation or something. So then again, we thought about what kind of animals had similar looking orienta orientation in the teeth. And we thought about animals like the bowfin, the snakehead or the salmon fish. And in all of these, it's like I said, they had, they, they would use these mostly as a function to trap, to help them trap live prey. So could this, so there's a possibility, we suggested that it's possible that this animal was then using these teeth as a function for helping them capture live prey. Because I mean, it is tricky also to use such a long lower jaw for hunting, right? The teeth past the occlusion margin are also tricky to interpret. Um, there is an ichthyosaur that's, I'm going off topic a tiny bit, but uh, there's an ichthyosaur that had a long, I believe it was upper jaw though, um, but I will double check. It could be lower jaw anyway. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's upper jaw though, that, um, that had some teeth going past the occlusion as well. And in this case, they interpreted it as possibly uh, it being used for injuring prey to help them catch them after. So could an inacanthus maybe have a similar function with this jaw? That's a possibility. Again, it's all fossil, right? So it's we're suggesting things. Uh, we want, of course, we have to compare this with. It's so rare to see something with such a an animal with such a long protrusion in the, especially lower jaw. We we looked into the record, the fossil record, and also in the modern world, uh, what other vertebrates have such extreme lower jaw protrusion, and we have we come up with these animals. So we have uh, modern ones. We have the half beak, which is a really small little fish like this big. Uh, but we also have then in a fossil record uh, Ornithoprion, which people might know of from the Carboniferous, and this is the oldest that was known so far. You can see the Carboniferous being before the front here. And uh, we have Simirostrum that was described not too long ago as well from the Pliocene, so much more recent animal, a cetacean like dolphin related. And we have from the same a from well more or less the same from the same period from the Devonian but Middle Devonian this animal this animal called Doriaspis. Uh, that also has this something called a pseudorostrum, which some people could kind of make it on, not quite analogous, but close enough to analogous to this lower jaw. But it's an agnathan, which means jawless fish, so it doesn't actually have jaws. That makes Anacanthus so far the oldest known to have such a lower jaw protrusion uh, in the vertebrate record. Uh, we, of course, put this in the phylogeny. And it plots again within the. It also plots within the Selenostate family, uh, with explains with the large eyes, right, and the short uh, cheek region. But to sum things up a little bit, uh, we have this uh, big variety. So we have when we think of the record in Morocco, at least as I'm, as I focused on this, this was the the like the the amount of the diversity we have for Arthrodi is back in the Franian, so the first stage of the late Devonian. There was a lot of placodums already known from there, lots of Arthrodi is known from there. With, oh, I didn't put this, sorry, with the horn ones in gray, the horn fossil ones you can see here, all these come from the Selenostate family. So there's a lot of Selenostates in Morocco during the Franian period. And now, and then when we look at what we knew from the Feminian in the late Devo, like in, in Morocco, sorry, we only had these three known, the Glosteus, Tafilitis, and Titanictis, so these large animals, very large animals. And now we can add another two more. Um, that not only adds diversity to it, but also adds uh, disparity because you can see very different looking creatures and also adding morpho like morphology that we, even though we suspected we didn't have the evidence for it before. And with Anacanthus, we have this whole modularity question coming in, seeing like this extreme uh, modularity basically kicking in at that time already. Uh, the exceptional preservation of, oops, get rid of this, it's in the way, sorry. Uh, the exceptional preservation in Mamasictis reveals, of course, as I mentioned, a new uh, macropelagic body morphology uh, with actual evidence. 
we have come on we go. we have uh, the teeth orientation to think of for any acanthus and endodontitis for both that suggests that there were they could have used their teeth to help them trap uh, live prey. And finally, any acanthus is I mentioned the oldest case of extreme jaw elongation in vertebrates, uh, which but also demonstrates a high modularity modularity sorry already at an early stage in vertebrate life. And with that, I want to thank you all for listening. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, thank you so much. Um, that was really, really interesting um, and really cool for pictures as well. Um, so um, just a reminder to the audience, um, you can send in questions um, via the chat to the questions that Paleo Facts host, or you can raise your hand and we'll um, unmute you so that you can ask your question by voice. Um, so we've had a few questions in already. Um, so I will paste these into the chat so that you can see them. Okay. Um, and so our first question is from K. Sender Sawa. And Sender asks, how deep were the ecosystems which the Thyla clock of Balan attains to? <laughs> the ecosystems. Um, <laughs> um, of academics consistently found at these depths, does that tell us anything about their physiology? So, good question. So the uh, the depth was, I always call that deep because it's not deep, but in my mind, when I say the numbers, it sounds deep. Uh, it's like a couple hundred meters expected, more or less in depth at the time uh, for the Thylacocephalon assemblage. And around the late, it, it stays about the same during the late Devonian period. So the depth would be about two, three hundred meters, something like this expected. Um, lots of these placoderms, and also lots of sharks as well from these layers, they're all found together. So we would, ex we kind of expect them to be found at similar depths. Um, although there is a suspicion that there was some anoxia or at least not full anoxia, more like hy hypo, well, oh, I'm missing the word right now. <laughs> There's a lack of oxygen, sorry, at the in the more like the very deeper ones. So we would expect them to be of course in the water column more in general, same as the thylacocephalons, actually, which would explain also why we have such nice preservation for some of these specimens. Um, and then does it tell any, anything about the physiology? So, I mean, we can, there is some, some things that we have with the, associated with these shallow waters, right? For example, with these selenostes, which is why, I guess, why we find some of them there as well. We have these large eyes. Uh, because we do expect that the waters for some reason they're shallow but still relatively dark possibly which is why some of these animals are found the same for the thylacocephalans they have these very large eyes which were interpreted as helping them to be living there in darker waters uh, yeah hope that Great. answers the question <laughs> <laughs> awesome thank you um so we have another question and um um, Roy Plotnik and um, Roy asks, could the protrusive lower jaw be used as a probe in soft sediments to feed on infernal animals? So good question. <laughs> so we we were, we were thinking about these things with uh, well half beaks. I'm guessing you're thinking of this with the half beaks, right? Because the the these animals are suspected to use these. Yeah, this protrusion to dig into the sediments to find food, um, which se which seems much easier for these small, like these very tiny animals, right? It seems like it would be a lot. There would be a lot of digging around to feed to be able to feed such a big animal, but it is not. I mean, it's it is also a possibility. It's not. Yeah, it's not impossible. There's a. It it can be in a, in a another interpretation for the protrusion. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we have another question. Uh, from Charles Cooney, who asks, who also says, wonderful and fascinating talk. Did you look at the microstructures of the teeth? Do they show an, an amyloid cover? Um, 
so I'm not sure for which one. I'm guessing the last one for Anionicanthus. So we we did do some. I didn't show them there, but we actually have them on the on a hidden slide. And I can show them if you if you like. Um, we had a look at the at the teeth structures. Uh, there's nothing showing signs of enameloid cover or enamel in general. It's just what we usually expect, even though it's highly crystallized. Uh, yes, crystallized. Um, so it's a bit tricky, but we could see in one or two. I didn't put them in this slide, so I can't show it to you. But we saw in one or two specific uh, thin sections some traces of the the um, dentinous tissue, and potentially Martin was also uncertain of the of the pulp cavity in one of them, like small traces of it. Uh, but lots of it's recrystallized, so it is it is tricky to say. Um, but we did have a look at the microstructures of it, and we could see well. In the inner structures, and we could see, especially in the jaws, more than in the teeth. The teeth didn't reveal that much, uh, not so much interesting features, but the the lower jaw itself had a lot of interesting uh, things to say as well. Thank you. Um. So. Um. So we have another question. Uh, one second. Um, uh, so we've had another question uh, from Rimbangoni who asks, are teeth in placoderms composed of enamel or are they more like overgrowth that is part of the jaw? Mm -hmm. And uh, so two very specific fishes, uh, uh, like placoderms, their posterior teeth are very odd looking like phalangeal teeth. How did these placoderms feed? Yeah, so the teeth in placoderms are, that's actually why they're, they're an interesting group to look at because their teeth are quite different uh, than what we see in the other vertebrates basically. So that's actually why some, there is still, some ongoing debate. There was a lot of, especially going in the early two thousands, about how, uh, whether or not we should actually call placoderm teeth teeth. So that's why in in that paper, for example, when we talked about Liptonotictes, we had teeth in apostrophes just to keep it open, um, and that's mostly because even though you have lots of lots of the structures are the same, so you have the uh, dentinous tissue, you have the pulp cavities, the canals connecting to the bone. You don't actually have enamel. There's there's a lack of enamel or enamelite cover on it. Uh, so it's more like in that way, it's more like yeah, an overgrowth, let's say, of the jaw in that sense. So that you would look at them from you would look at the jaw itself, and the it would look like it's just one with with the jaw. That is, there's no separate unit. You can't pull a tooth out, for example. And uh, for the second part, do do. So yeah, the we expect these teeth, as I was mentioning very briefly before, we ex we expect these teeth to be used. I guess it's how you would imagine them, kind of like pharyngeal teeth. I think some of them had these functions, which was to make sure like that they were trapping the live prey and couldn't they couldn't escape back out. It's kind of funky to say, but kind of gross in a way. <laughs> but uh, so they would basically kind of like try to. It's probably so either they managed to endure them or not. Who knows the hunting method, right? That's something hypothetical. But when they eventually got to trapping the prey, then they would just use these teeth to prevent the animal from escaping. And then it has no other option, basically, but to go down and become food. <laughs> hey, um, so we have another question. Um... <laughs> <laughs> got lots to say um, from Nina Witchen, um, who asks, who says, "Awesome talk. Um, perhaps difficult to demonstrate, but could you try to explain a bit more how teeth that extend beyond the occlusion could be used to injure prey? I'm having a hard time imagining how that would work." Yeah, I, I also have a hard time imagining a little bit how that would work, just because it's the lower jaw. So the lower jaw, of course, has less stability. It's more fragile, right? Then than if you would actually do this with the upper one with the strength of the skull helping. Um, so 
it was it was it was just something that was suggested based on what we've seen in this other paper on the sixty so called Excalibursaurus, Excalibursaurus, <laughs> and um, this it was suggested then that the the animal also had because of this protrusion that wasn't with both jaws at the same time, but also just the one, uh, and teeth also going past the occlusion. They suggested that may that it could have been used. Um, I forgot the the whole evidence behind it right now because it's been a while. <laughs> um, but I'm happy to have a look into it often, and we can chat about it later. Uh, and these they would, uh, yeah, basically these teeth would have been used to stab. That's what how they said it <laughs> to basically stab the prey to injure them, so that it would basically be weaker and make it easier for them to catch. Simply, so could any acanthus do this with its lower jaw? I, st I also have a hard time imagining it because it the teeth don't go all the way to the front. Like in the front section, there is like it's so it's smooth, and it doesn't seem to have teeth particularly when when uh, like worn down. So it is something that I wouldn't I wouldn't bet on them being able to do it. But we did put this forward just in case uh, as a as an idea, uh, based on other evidence with. As there's very few animals you can compare it to, we try to think about what's known from the other animals, how feasible it is, could it be done? And as we all know in the fossil record, it's always a bit tricky to know how, like where the limit is, right? Of it's feasible, it's not feasible. Uh, but we would like to get a bit more, hopefully. The the hyoid structure is very solid. You saw the triangular piece was very, usually they're much thinner and more seem more fragile. So the fact that it's so robust could maybe argue that it, there also was some support function to it, helping with the strengthening of the jaw because of the stability. So maybe that could have helped. But yeah, it's something that's very hypothetical. Great. Um, so we're going to go with one more question. Um, we have, we've had a few in. Um, <laughs> let's close up with one um, that was pasted in the chat slightly earlier. Um, age old question, why did the placoderms have these bone structures to hide from the predators or to hide the electro signal to hunt? Uh, sorry, I was reading the question, it popped away. <laughs> it's reading it again. Uh, so when you mean the bone structures, I'm guessing you mean the, the bony armor. I had that question a few times. If that's the case, then we're not quite it's there there wasn't really been like to my knowledge big things big studies about what the armor itself was for uh but then i read electro signal so i'm guessing it could also be related to the lower jaw so if it's about the lower jaw uh itself we did check with the histology to see if there were any traces uh any remnants that could suggest um electro signal in there as we also thought because for example so semi rostrum was suggested to have was interpreted to have an extra signal in there and same for some of the other animals uh with on the snout mostly like in sharks for example some of the sharks um so we we compared the histology to see if there was anything indicating that there was also one placoderm the one i showed with a very long one Carolinema. he that one was also in the histology had uh, structures indicating or suggesting at least that there's a potential for Electro signals, but there's none of this in in any acanthus in this case. So why why did they grow such weird jaw? Yeah, that's the question I'd like to answer as well. <laughs> why? <laughs> Thanks so much. Um. So um. If your question didn't get answered just now, um, definitely stick around for tea time. Um, so we'll move into that very shortly. Um, but I'm just going to take over the screen share. Um, thank Lena very um for her really awesome talk. Um, and thank you to the audience um for joining us today. Um, please remember to fill out the weekly feedback form. The link will be in the chat very shortly so that we can learn a bit more about who attended today's seminar. And join us next week. Um, at 12 o'clock UTC um, for a talk um, by Mohammed Akib bin Safran from Malaysia, um, who will be talking about Graptolite's research in Southeast Asia from its uses in biostratigraphy to the paleo environment and thermal maturity studies.
So up next, um, we have tea time um, with Melina. Um, so this is an informal conversation about um, the talk in a relaxed setting. Um, and we have a fun question of the week um, to help us um, stimulate a bit of conversation at the start, um, which this week is, if you could choose an ocean to live in, which ocean would it be and why? Um, but first, we're going to have a quick break. Um, so remember to get up, uh, walk around, have a quick drink of water, come back in two minutes. And if you have fun paleo pets, remember to bring them with you. Um, and I'll start the timer and see you very shortly. Mm -hmm. 